Hi, everyone, and welcome to the launch of uh, an Asset Phoenix model. Asset Phoenix is a project funded by the FNRS, the Belgian National Fund for Scientific Research, since uh, June 2021. And uh, it has benefited from many years of development before that at the University of Melbourne in Australia. Uh, Nestled Phoenix was conducted at the Université Catholique de Louvain in Belgium, and uh, we will talk about it in the coming two hours. Uh, this recording is um, post-launch, so we had a technical glitch on the day which uh, resulted in us losing the first half an hour of recording. So we kindly asked our one our first keynote speaker, Verena Goswain, to re-record her talk, which she kindly did. And so this recording is a compiled version of this video, her keynote speech, and then we pick it up from the recording on the actual day of the launch. And so as such, uh, I'd like to quickly go through the motions and reintroduce our moderator for the day. And then I'll uh, reintroduce Verena as a keynote before moving on the other details. So Damien Trigo is our moderator for uh, the NASA Phoenix launch, and we're happy to have him. Damien obtained a master's degree in architectural engineering from KU Leuven in 20, 2008. Following his studies, he worked for nine months on the Sufi Quad research projects focusing on sustainability, financial, and quality evaluation of dwellings. He then gained practical experience as an architectural engineer at EVR Architecten, specializing in sustainable architecture and developing sustainability assessment tools. In 2012, Damien began his PhD research at KU Leuven at the Department of Architecture, concentrating on creating a life cycle-based sustainability assessment method for neighborhoods, very relevant for Nesset Phoenix. From 2018 to 2020, he worked as a postdoctoral researcher, focusing on developing environmental benchmarks for buildings in Belgium. And since June 2020, he's been working as a senior researcher at Energieville Vito, KU Leuven. He's actively involved in various LCA research projects, and serves as a coordinator for the development of the Belgian LCA2 totem. And I have the pleasure of collaborating with Damien on totem itself. And so uh, Damien will pick it up from half of this recording in terms of the moderation. And uh, we'll continue now with the first keynote by uh, Verena. But before I introduce Verena, I just want to touch base very quickly on Nested Phoenix itself. So Nested Phoenix is a bottom-up parametric multi-scale model that integrates material flow analysis and stocks analysis with life cycle assessment from the material scale all the way up to build stocks of cities and nations, basically. So it's, a, it's an extremely detailed model that is quite data intensive, as we'll see. And uh, we'll take you through the journey of, uh, of the development of this tool, its functionalities, its scope, its uh, you know future research milestones. And we will include a live demonstration of the tool itself, the beta versions that we currently have. And so I'll pass it on now to Dr. Verena Gershwin uh, for the first keynote. So Verena has a master's degree from ETH Zurich and completed her PhD in civil engineering at Instituto Superior Tecnico de Lisbon in Portugal in 2020. She is currently working as a postdoc for Professor Guillaume Habert as the chair of sustainable construction at ETH and as an ESG manager for the real estate developer and asset manager Freyo. The group. Her work includes consulting and research of the sustainable built environment, and her interdisciplinary research focuses on resource use and environmental impacts of large-scale application of bio-based building materials. And she is our first keynote speaker for the launch. So thanks for watching. Hello and welcome everybody. First of all, thank you so much to Katarina and Andrea for having me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here at the Nested Phoenix event and to speak about uh, the important topic of urban metabolism. I'll give you a brief introduction and then talk about the theory of urban metabolism and the tools we have available for it. Then we'll talk more about the modeling approaches and the types of dynamics that can be modeled or should be modeled, and then about the remaining challenges we're facing today. As you know, most of the global population lives in cities. Um, and the trend of urbanization is still growing. And this is interesting and important because urbanization coupled with growing prosperity are the main drivers of building material consumption. Here on the right side, you can see Sydney between 1991 and 2012. And as you can see, the urban built up area has grown immensely. What's important to keep in mind is that depending on where you are, 
different cities ask for different solutions. In general, we can say that in the so-called developed world, cities are mostly built and the challenge is to retrofit the existing building stock. In the so-called developing world, cities are still facing rapid population growth and economic growth, which leads to urban expansion, which means new houses must be built. Anyway, in both cases, we need massive amounts of new building materials. I really like this quote by Gang Liu from the Southern University of Denmark, who wrote about material stocks and flows that a retrospect on the quantity, quality, and patterns of material stocks is a prerequisite for projecting future demand, identifying urban mining potentials, and informing sustainable urbanization strategies. And it's really this. We need to look at the past, understand the past and the existing stocks and current flows to be able to inform future strategies for more sustainable urban areas. Moreover, there are two key words when we talk about the motivation for understanding material stocks and flows or understanding urban metabolism. The first key word is dematerialization, meaning using less material. It's considered a key factor in urban planning, but it can only be achieved through identifying drivers and characteristics of urban metabolism. The second uh, key word is rematerializing construction. That means using different types of material, considering the local availability, reusing and recycling materials by mining the cities. Only in that way we can induce a systematic shift that is required for a circular economy. From a research point of view, many studies have already performed uh, material flow analysis and LCAs of the built environment. However, most of them are kind of a mere accounting exercise. But it's really important to integrate spatial and temporal dynamics in the model to then also understand these dynamics in real life. Let's talk more about urban metabolism and its tools. Urban metabolism, in my understanding, is a concept that is used to assess urban sustainability. It allows to quantify a city's environmental burden by using different tools. These tools are material stock analysis, material flow analysis, life cycle assessment, and geospatial analysis. There might be others, but those are the most important ones. Looking at them in more detail, material stock analysis is basically making a material inventory of built environment stocks. Here you see an image of a paper from 2020 that shows the material stocks of Beijing. It divides the stocks into surface and subsurface and the different um, constitutions of the built environment. So it divides where the material is located in buildings, roads, railways, and in the metro. It also shows what kind of materials are used. This is important to understand the current state of the stock. Going beyond the, the total stock, uh, is being done by using material flow analysis. This is a tool to quantify inflows and outflows of the system. Often we use Sankey diagrams to show the results. Here you see a Sankey from the European economy in 2014 that shows, for example, how much material was imported and how much was uh, extracted domestically, and then how this material moves through the system and what's its final destination. Life cycle assessment is usually being done at the building scale. Uh, at its base is a kind of bill of quantities for all relevant building elements and processes. You then make a life cycle inventory. And in general, one can say that the more data you have available, the more uh, specific product specific data you have available, the better it is for the final result. However, you will have a very data intensive analysis then. Another advantage of LCA is that it's standardized at the European and at the international level. The so-called life cycle stages of a building are clearly classified. So over the whole life cycle, you have the product stage, the construction phase, the youth stage, the end of life phase, and then the so-called benefits and loads beyond the system boundary. Typical challenges of LCA in research are, for example, comparing results between consequential and attributional LCA, or employing dynamic LCA to better understand biogenic carbon and the, the temporary evolution of greenhouse gas emissions. The last tool that I would like to talk about is geospatial analysis. It's not so much a tool as it is really an information system. 
Basically, those are maps that include lots of data for every building. It allows to locate materials and other parameters in space. It then allows to analyze building by building, for example, including the building footprint and envelope. And beyond that, it allows to model location-dependent effects, such as shadowing and daylighting, due to the topography and climate conditions of your city. On the right, you can see two beautiful maps that were published by Andre Stefan and Aristide Apanasiades in 2017, and it really captures the state of the city in one beautiful image. An idea that I quite like, that I copied from Benjamin Goldstein, is the evolution of urban metabolism in different generations. The first generation of urban metabolism often used MFA only to analyze single material, material flows through cities. In the second generation of urban metabolism, we were also already moving beyond the quantification of mass by employing the embodied energy concept. And the so-called next generation urban metabolism, on the one hand, couples urban metabolism with LCA, and in this way allows to capture operational and embodied impacts of metabolic flows along the full life cycle of a product or along the full life cycle of a building or the city. It also allows to include a variety of LCA indicators. Of course, the most important one is CO2, but others are also possible. And as I mentioned before, it builds upon an international standard, which is quite useful to then compare results and better understand the different methods. And then coupling it to GIS, a new perspective is provided, especially if you want a high spatial resolution, this is really helpful. It then allows to improve the understanding of the physical composition of the built environment stock. The coupling of tools to reach this next generation urban metabolism can be classified of, as moving from building LCA to urban LCA by coupling it with material flow analysis and then by integrating it with the spatial side by using GIS. Typically in studies, this is being done at the neighborhood of city scale. It always requires a building stock model. We'll talk about that in a moment as there are different types of that. And by linking it with GIS, you have a better idea of the spatial distribution of material and environmental flows at the urban scale. Typical challenges are here, the choosing of the right modeling approach, uh, being confronted with data scarcity and the modeling and interpretation of the evolution over time and space. So how do we model building stocks? There are four main methodological approaches. The two most famous ones are bottom-up accounting and top-down accounting. Using bottom-up bottom -up accounting, you place the end-use object, usually the building or the infrastructure you're analyzing, and the inventory at the model core. This allows you to reach a high level of detail with the model. Top-down accounting, on the other hand, is often used at the national scale, and it's useful if you want to compare different types of flows. It employs inflow statistics and input-output tables. Remote sensing approach can be considered a bottom-up accounting exercise, and it's often used in a data-scarce environment, as it relies on using uh, remote sensing data, such as LiDAR data, to sample building stocks. So-called demand-driven modeling is similar to both bottom-up and top-down accounting in terms of method and data. However, instead of using historical statistics, it uses socioeconomic indicators, for example, the square meter per person. And in this way, it allows to identify trends in the evolution of our building stock. In any case, no matter which model you employ, I think it's always very useful to think about the iPad equation. The iPad equation stands for impact is equal to population times affluence times technology. It's at the center of industrial ecology, and it really helps to understand the environmental impacts of the technological society. Talking about dynamics in models, that means if you want to have a dynamic result, dynamic impacts, you must have, must have some kind of dynamic in the input model parameters that are population, affluence, and technology. Specifically, the technology parameter is interesting when talking about buildings. This can be, for example, material intensity and emission intensity. The different types of dynamics can be categorized in different ways. I wrote a review, review paper in 2019 and came up with a classification of three different types of dynamics. The first and second one are more intuitive. We have spatial dynamics, which means 
there is difference or there are differences or dynamics between two areas at the same moment in time. Then we have so-called evolutionary temporal dynamics, which means if you look at the same place, the same city over different years, you will see a difference, you will see a dynamic. And the last one I call spatial cohort dynamics, which is looking at a place at one moment in time, but focusing on groups of similar buildings or archetypes that have similar characteristics based on the history, based on the architectural design or the energy intensity that was used at the time to build or maintain the building. And it's important to try to incorporate those dynamics into models, as a model is always a simplified version of reality. So only by incorporating dynamics, we are able to better understand cities at different scales and over time. My review also showed that most studies until now have focused on emissions and are rather limited in their attempt to model dynamics in space and time. So there's a lot of work still to be done. And I'm curious to hear more about the Nested Phoenix project. Remaining challenges of the next generation urban metabolism are number one, data scarcity. The question of how good is good enough? Often we are confronted with a lack of data, lack of clarity, robustness, and validity. But I would like to mention that the amount and type of data should depend on the goal of the study. You should keep this in mind when collecting and uh, analyzing the data you have available. If you want to inform urban mining and circular economy, then yes, usually the more data you have, the better it is. But also consider storing and managing your data in a digital environment, for example, in BIM. And if you want to update your model, it helps if you parameterize it. Andre Stefan also in a, wrote in a recent paper that it can recommend that models should be bottom-up, parametric, multi-scale over the life cycle, spatially explicit, and integrate uncertainty. And I fully agree with that. However, besides the goal of the study, which you should always keep in mind when defining your methodology, also keep in mind the stakeholders' point of view. Here we have three important stakeholders when talking about the built environment. Researchers, policymakers, and real estate investors. Researchers sometimes like to make more detailed and more complex models just because they can, just because we can. But in general, I think the goal here should be to predict the future, to uncover sustainable pathways, and based on that, to be able to recommend, uh, to formulate recommendations for policymakers. Then policymakers can use those recommendations to try and outline policies and regulations to achieve a net zero economy with continuous economic growth and other challenges. Real estate investors, on the other hand, don't have the urban perspective so much as more the portfolio perspective. They are now confronted more and more with disclosing their so-called ESG uh, performance. And also here we can contribute quite a lot by understanding building stocks. The remaining time of our presentation, I would like to talk about topics that are close to my heart in my research. The first one would be circular material flows. So I investigate a lot bio-based materials and the use of bio-based materials at a big scale. And that's interesting for different reasons. First of all, for reducing the embodied carbon um, and for storing biogenic carbon in the built environment by moving biomass from nature into buildings. But also bio-based materials are naturally circular as they regrow in nature. However, if you talk about using bio-based materials at a large scale, to retrofit a full city or even to formulate strategies for new buildings at a country scale, you have to keep in mind that these bio-based materials need to grow somewhere. So the question of land use is very relevant. On the right side, you can see a, a graphic from a recent paper of me and my co-authors that tries to match demand and supply of bamboo, which is a structural material, and straw, which is a thermal insulation material. And it shows that in those cases, actually, it matches up quite nicely that in the global north, where you need more insulation material because you need to refurbish the existing building stock, you have a lot of straw available that allows you to do so. While in the global south, where you have a lot of demand for new construction and you need structural materials, you have quite a lot of bamboo. So consider the supply and demand question in your models. And again, this relates back to spatial dynamics and models. 
To summarize challenges, I think there are four different groups that are relevant at the moment. First one was data intensity and method. We spoke about that. Then the question of how to move towards a circular economy model applied to the building sector. I think for now we should focus on maximizing reuse and recycled materials in new buildings. But for the future, we should integrate design for disassembly guidelines in new design and also in urban uh, planning activities. Then to model spatial dynamics, aspects should be included that go beyond the building. So questions of the supply chain and transportation that consider where does the material come from, where does the waste go, and what are the local needs? So the matching supply and demand. Specifically for bio-based materials, as I noted, land use is a big question, but also land use competition. So the competition with other sectors that require the same amount of material to transition to net carbon. Thank you very much for your attention. First uh, presentation I can build on, and I'd like to talk about tools and beyond, as I guess it makes sense at the launch event of a new to uh, tool to talk about the tool. But um, I want to embed the discussion of tools in a broader context and also talk about what I call computational sustainable design. And I want to talk about four aspects. So what is computational to sustainable design and why do we need it? Then what are tools and integrated tools, um, how can we scale them up and what does AI have to do with it? And finally, how can we involve the stakeholders? So if we talk about um, what's computational sustainable design, well, for me, it's this overlap of these big fields of well, sustainability, then digitalization and the design process. And if I talk about design here, I mean the context of the built environment and similar as Verena, most of the times I talk about buildings, but it's actually the same for infrastructure projects, a tunnel or a bridge. And if we talk about sustainability, we will also show later some examples. It's often environmental aspects, but it's also the same for social or uh, economic aspects of sustainability. And digitalization, well, a lot of this relates to digital tools and artificial intelligence. And in the small area where they overlap, that's where, uh, uh, well, I feel home, so it's lots of fun to do research there. But besides the fun aspect, I think also there's really a huge potential uh, to improve and build more sustainable. So the overarching question I usually have in these projects is how can digital approaches support the design process of a sustainable built environment? So how can we actually use them to bring knowledge and tools to the ones that design and take decisions. And why is this even needed? Well, when I came to Sweden four years ago, I thought, well, everything looks fine and the Nordics are often considered as an example for sustainability. And if you look at different index, for example, as this SDG index, the Nordics always rank best. But then if you look in more detail, well, they all still have the same challenges. One of them is climate change, but there are also others. And it doesn't work. Not everybody on the world could live like somebody in Sweden for this. So there's still a lot to do, and um, I think tools can help us on this way. If we look at digitalization, we also see that the Nordics, but actually in this uh, figure also Belgium, are digital front runners. And while this don't know how McKinsey defined this in this case, but uh, I see a lot of, uh, especially compared to Germany, where I come from, a lot of more digitalization initiatives in the Nordics. But then again, if we look in the details, we see that often construction rates just above agriculture and hunting, and also if the real estate market is um, quite low in regards to the overall digitalization index. So this still leaves a big room for improvement and to make use of this big potential. So if we look in practice today, I would more draw these circles like this, that there, there is actually very little or no overlap. And my aim is, or my motivation is to use digitalization as a means to bring more sustainability into the design process. And that's where the tools come into play. And if we look at digital design tools now uh, on the internet or on Food for Rhino, it, probably looks like this. So there are so many tools and uh, at least I see uh, two new tools pop in on my LinkedIn feed every week. And the question is, so why are there so many? Why do 
why are so few used and do we really need all of them? So I think we need to talk not about tools as such, or, but about integrated tools, meaning integrating them into the design and the decision making process. Now, um, of course, this can be done for many aspects. I would like to start by the example of LCA or life cycle assessment and Verena thankfully already introduced this a bit. So if you look at LCA, it's often uh, considered as a very complex method and difficult to use. You have to make a lot of assumptions and it takes a lot of time, but I don't think it has to do or as also Verena said, it depends a lot of what's your aim and what's uh, where do you want to go with it? And one example here is from my time when I was a postdoc in the same group as uh, Verena at Zurich, unfortunately not at the same time, but um, I was involved in this digital fabrication center, a huge national initiative to try out new ways to digitally fabricate parts of the building. And they come up with this fancy ceiling that's uh, casted on a 3D printed formwork. And then afterwards they wanted to well show that it's also environmentally friendly. So they asked us, can you do an LCA of it? And well, of course we can. We said if you give us all the information uh, of the materials that you used, all the processes, then we can calculate global warming potential in CO2 equivalent, for example, if you want. And we did this and they were happy, but we thought, okay, this doesn't have any influence on the design. It's now in this case, too late. Maybe the designers learn something for the next project, but can't we integrate it while they're designing? And this is a very simple example of using this grasshopper parametric workflow of saying, OK, while the designer tests different options of this building slab, we can show, uh, for example, the global warming potential or other indicators that are used in Switzerland in real time at the same time, and they can use this information as a decision making. And this is in a way very simple because you just connect the volume with a material and you can do the calculation of the embodied impacts um, and then provide the information in the design environment that the designer uses in this case. If we think of the same approach, but on the building level, we could, for example, integrate this into SketchUp, which is a tool a 3D modeling tool used in early design stages and considered very easy. So if we link this geometry with a calculation tool in the background where we can set different parameters, the tool can calculate the global warming potential over the whole life cycle, also including the operational impacts. So if we change the insulation thickness, for example, this has an impact on the heating demand, then also on um, the global warming potential in the use phase. Uh, or if we change the geometry of the building, for example, orientation, we will have different solar gains on the windows, has an impact on the heat gain, has an impact on the whole life cycle. And calculating this manually would be lots of effort, but if we have the tool, the tool just calculates for every change we make in real time, well, more or less real time, the impact this has on the, the whole design. So in this very playful way, we can uh, use let the designers explore the design space and then hopefully come up with um, better solutions than they would without such a tool. And uh, this is now the tool developed by what's now a startup in Germany, but we developed different similar tools at ETH. And I also use the same tools for teaching here for students in Sweden because it's really uh, nice as a way to uh, well, take the fear of complex yeah. LCA, but also um, let them explore all these different interconnections and the interdependencies of choosing a material, choosing a geometry, and also the technical building equipment. Um, so here, the tool can really help to inform the decision making. Now, we still have to do a lot of manual inputs here, so if we think as researchers and do stuff because we can, as Verena said. The next step would be how can we use the computer identify optimal solutions? For example, in the case of retrofitting this little single family house, we could imply insulation on the 
different types of insulation, bio-based, conventional. We can explain, uh, exchange the windows. We can integrate new heating systems. And all of, all of this has an impact on both the operational impact, but also the embodied global warming potential. So we can tell the computer, come up with random solutions, recombine the best ones, eliminate the bad ones, and optimize our building towards the total global warming potential. And this genetic algorithm, the background does this by uh, slowly converging. And in this case, we cannot really be sure if we the algorithm can find the global optimum. Um, but in this case, we just say, OK, after a certain time, in this case, it was 30 generations without finding a new optimum, the algorithm will stop and propose this solution as the optimal solution for this one building and the one location and all these parameters. Now, this was all talking about LCA and energy consumption. Um, but the same approach could be used if we talk, for example, social aspects. And I have now a PhD student working here on Chalmers of integrating different key performance indicators into design work of urban planners. So let's imagine in an area, a new uh, or there's a redevelopment, some houses should be reconstructed. And depending on the type of apartments you construct, if you have more smaller or bigger ones, you can assume uh, which population will move there? Is it more families, more elderly? And this gives you an, in relation to what kind of amenities you need. Do you need more schools, healthcare, groceries, and so on? So this is a very simple early design approach, but you can again use this concept of providing the information in this typical design environment that the user uses. Now, <laughs> These were like in the very smaller projects. I want to now talk about AI, as everybody talks about AI now, but as an AI of way of scaling up what we do on this individual project by project level. And one example here is large scale renovation, and this is a challenge all over Europe. So this is an image from Sweden, but I think um, in many Yes, uh, yeah, so called developed countries with lots of uh, buildings from the 70s, 60s, 80s. We have a challenge of how to re renovate. And well, as I showed, we can use a little optimizer, or in this case, a robot with a calculator. And of course, it's not a real calculator, but in the background, run some combinations of tools that. Um, luckily, became quite easy to use. So I assume many in the audience are familiar with those grasshopper plugins that connect to um, energy calculation engines and then can combine in this case uh, do a combined calculation of the life cycle assessment also cost of uh, um, life cycle cost assessment to calculate the impact of different renovation packages and if you run this in loops as i showed you can also optimize it and the uh, computer can propose solutions. So here the challenge is lucky not the simulation environment uh, anymore. Of course, in the detail, uh, <laughs> my colleagues from building physics would see there's much more research to be done there. But uh, from my perspective, that's not the biggest overall challenge anymore, but the info, this lack of information. So if we want to run, have the computer propose solutions, we need a thermal 3D model. And how do we convert this image that we have into this 3D model? Well, one approach that's done by any researchers now is, um, as we do it on a daily basis, ask Google. So go, for example, to Google Maps or Google Earth and look what they already um, yeah, have digitized. In this specific example, it was interesting because we don't see any 3D geometry here. It's just a flat image. and then if we would like to go to Google Street View, we see that, well, in this case, there are actually some scaffolding in front, and it's quite difficult to uh, get automatically some details from this building. But um, luckily, I have a really nice and skilled colleague at the computer science department, and she came up with a workflow where, for example, a resident or a facility manager would just walk around the building with her phone once 
and collect now this video sped up, but <laughs> let's say walk around the building once, which takes five to 10 minutes and collects this information. And then the uh, some train network converts this into a 3D geometry. And once we have this 3D geometry, we can uh, use this to, for example, flatten it, use some other networks to recognize the window, and then uh, use this to give us our 3D model. All with the idea to limit the manual effort and we can scale this up to a whole city, a whole country to lower the barrier to actually assess the renovation potential and uh, renovate those buildings. OK, now we talked a lot about computers, but if we say, OK, we want to have integrated tools that are actually used, of course, we need to talk about the people and. We also showed the slides of different stakeholders, and in my case, I've worked a lot with the architects and engineers as designers in mind. But of course, we also want other uh, decision makers, politicians or citizens to be involved in the design process. And there, I think digitalization can also provide many potentials, and I want to give a few examples. We have one collaboration with something called Universeum at um, in Gothenburg, which is a mix between a, you know, uh, a museum and something, an experience center for science. And they have something called VisLab. And in this visualization lab, they have a 3D printed model of Gothenburg. And we can use this to show different data that we get from urban analysis parts. And um, then show this to the public and um, yeah, in a way more maybe intuitive way show different um, aspects or metrics such as the energy demand over the whole city in different quarters um, that's required over a year or um, the shading and the sunlight hours over the year or over a, over a day and specific time of the year throughout the city or how different mobility strategies influence how people will probably move over a day or also over the year around the city. And also some noise simulations for some new developments, which can then be linked to a screen, for example, on the side to answer, transform more information. Uh, another example was the virtual reality. So um, there is a project close to Gothenburg where they want to build a new neighborhood for 10,000 people, basically in the middle of the forest. And of course, many people are not a bit critical of this. And uh, the question was, how can all these impacts that are well beyond some numbers that we can calculate in LCA be communicated to cities? And where well, some researchers from Chalmers came up with this workflow to use satellite data and um, to automatically generate those trees in Unreal Engine, so in a virtual environment. Um, and then the designers could place there in, uh, with, I think it was City Engine generated building blocks into it uh, to let the users experience what yeah, an early version of this new neighborhood could look like. And then the uh, users could walk around in one-to-one -one scale or also zoom out to see, and then, um, for example, move buildings around or participate into th this very early design process. And the idea to, was to use this also as a communication tool for workshops. So, uh, for example, you can take screenshots of areas that you like and then later discuss them. And we tested this uh, with, uh, school children that visited us and put on the goggles and had lots of fun of walking around the city but actually also could use the tool to say okay here is where i would like my shopping mall or i i really like ice hockey i want an ice rink in this building um, in this area and in such a way uh yeah make sure they have an interest in participating in this very early design phase now one more video and then <laughs> it's enough information from my side.
But if we think of communicating results, another thing that is a potential for conflicts are building permits. So the idea was you can use your phone and augmented reality to show your neighbors, for example, your new summer house that you want to build. And uh, if or if it doesn't block the views to the lake or also in big development areas in the city, like this huge skyscraper they're building in Gothenburg, um, yeah, it would be nice for people to get a feeling what this uh, would look like. So there were lots of examples now, but maybe to summarize and conclude, I think there are all these opportunities um, besides that, uh, uh, yeah, fun for researchers to do stuff. I think it's really a way to bring all these sustainability criteria into the design process by yeah, using the tools, integrating in the design environment where decisions are made directly by the designers, but also use it as a communication tool then uh, to, in a way, the end users, the um, citizens or politicians who have to take decisions or difficult decisions uh, based on complex information. So if we visualize these in different forms using the digital tools, this can hopefully really help to bring yeah, more sustainability into the design process. So I look forward to uh, yeah, Nested Phoenix as the addition <laughs> to this digital tool environment. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Alexander, for the nice. Thank you, Alexander, for the nice overview of uh, new tools and possibilities to use tools in the design process. Uh, are there any questions from the audience related to some of the tools that Alexander has presented? I will take a mic now. Um, so I'm wondering what are the incentives for architects to actually try to optimize uh, the output the emission of buildings today? Are there existing regulations or coming regulations? Or is it just because people are more aware of climate change and that they care that they will try to optimize this? Yeah, I think that's a very important question <laughs> as the motivation. I think it's both. So yeah, there are regulations uh, upcoming or already in place. The situation in Sweden right now is that you have to do a climate declaration. So you have to calculate also the embodied impacts of your building, but there's no limit value yet. Um, but the assumption is that soon there will be limit values. Then there are, there are more, um, voluntary certification systems like BREEAM, DGNB in Germany or um, others, um, Milieu Birknet in Sweden, where you also have to calculate body impacts and then you get points if you have lower impacts and that's a motivation for typically project developers to use such a certification, which at the end, um, yeah, is used as I guess as a marketing tool to advertise the building and then yeah, we also have, of course, clients that just do it because they're environmentally conscious or architects who just say, OK, we want to do it because it's part of our design philosophy and we do it even if we don't get the uh, financial benefit directly. Question online. Hi. Uh, Andre, I'm speaking. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, excellent presentation. I'd like to ask a question about the uh, interaction part with uh, the citizens. If the whole process of involving them in this participatory process of design has introduced uh, new challenges or new insights that uh, were not uh, there in the beginning, something that affects the design process. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I cannot answer this yet <laughs> uh, because um, 
yeah, lots of changes of the companies who did the design and somehow um, I think that's a common challenge that there are many good ideas in the initial initial phase and uh, suddenly over this long design process, many things get dropped. So no, I don't know if this really um, changed here. The project lead who was involved, she really took part with the school kids and worked with it and she said she collected uh, nice insights, but now she left. She's at a different company and <laughs> yeah, reality, uh, unfortunately, yeah, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, one more question from James. Um, thanks, Andre. Hi, Alex. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, that was very insightful. And uh, as someone who's also involved in uh, tool development, I'm, I'm constantly reminded by Cedric Price's provocation, which is uh, technology is the answer, but what was the question? Um, and in this, you know, what seems to be an infinite landscape of tech tools for sustainable design, uh, how do you think we can guide decision makers to choose the right ones? Ooh, tricky question. <laughs> I think uh, it's good to start with the right questions. And I think also decision makers also for clients for new building they need guidance in identifying which questions they are or actually have. And whether it's with my architecture students here, I also say don't touch any schools, discuss uh, any tool, <laughs> discuss uh, with your group and maybe your tool is a pen and a piece of paper and discuss what, what's your idea, what's your concept, what do you actually want to answer? And then find a tool with the right method behind it to answer this question. And I think, um, well, students have to learn it, but also uh, maybe clients, project developers, we can ask Verena what she thinks, but I think they need support from more experienced, maybe consultants to ask those questions and then go towards the tools. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Uh, thank you very much. So we will now move to the presentation. <laughs> it's a bit acrobacy. <laughs> we will now move to the presentation of the Nested Phoenix project. So it's a research uh, project funded by FNRS and initiated by the University of Melbourne. The Nested Phoenix project is a bottom-up parametric model for an integrated life cycle assessment and material stocks and flow analysis of the built environment. So the presentations will be by uh, Professor uh, André Stefan, uh, Katarina, Roberto, and Gilders, I think. So a group of four, and I will leave them the floor to present themselves to the whole uh, public. So, André, yeah. Thank you very much. Good. All right, so we won't all come behind the lectern because that would be a little bit too crowded. We'll come what at one at a time. So uh, uh, apologies for the start, uh, the mic wasn't working well. So for those online, you missed a little bit the intro, but you'll have a chance to catch up on a lot of what was said during the presentation. Uh, I will start with the slides and then I'll be introducing the rest of the team on the slides. It's a little bit easier. So just give me one second to duplicate the screen in a better way. All right. Can everyone online see the screen? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for it. Great. So here we are. Uh, the launch of Nested Phoenix on the 20th of June 2023. And so before I start, I'd just like to take you a little bit on a walk through history. So the story of Nested Phoenix uh, dates back to a few hundred years now. <laughs> it dates back to the end of my PhD. So that's 10 years ago and one day today. So I defended on the 19th of June 2013. And so 
it's I will walk you through a little bit through this journey so you get a bit of an understanding of why we're trying to do what we're doing here. And before I start, I want to thank uh, two people here. Most importantly, Sare uh, here. Thanks for for all your support. And without you, this uh, project would certainly have never taken off the ground because someone needs to do all the other stuff when the other is intent on working until two in the morning. So thanks for making this happen. I think uh, yeah, you don't get enough credit for this. And also importantly, you collaborated technically on the project. So you're part of a paper and notably your landscape architecture uh, background helped out with a lot of the carbon sequestration modeling that I'll be talking about later. The second person is Rob Crawford, who's sleeping, uh, rightfully so. So uh, uh, he did uh, send through messages and he says, hi, he was a partner in crime for all these years on the chart here and before. Uh, so yeah, he was my PhD supervisor, my postdoctoral supervisor, and he's a super good friend. And we've been talking about Nested Phoenix for the last 10 years. So quickly, uh, the ancestor of Nested Phoenix is called Energy Metric. This is the model that came out of my joint PhD between UNB and the University of Melbourne. This model was actually, funnily enough, used by Architecture Klima for two years for a project on Brussels. It was the only place that had a license to use it, was Arnaud uh, Eva. And uh, this model took into account if, a, a few flows that we're covering today, but not all of them. After this, I moved to Australia. Uh, this is where I got the Graham Trelor Fellowship. This is a late, uh, named after the late Professor Graham Trelor. Very good person who would certainly be here with us if he could. Um, and this gave me the opportunity to work with a very good friend, Aristide Atanasiadis, who happened to be in Australia at the same time. <laughs> and then uh, we worked on a paper on Melbourne. Some of you might have seen some of these graphics. And this gave us a, an idea like, hey, oh, you could use the, that, the models that you developed at the building level. And I can bring in the GIS and we can put it together. And this is what happens. And so this is basically the foundation of Nested Phoenix in, uh, in some ways. Nested Phoenix as a word came up in 2017 after a few uh, weeks of thinking about a name for a good presentation. So uh, you can find the details about why it's called like this on the website. Uh, James Helal, who's awake at uh, 1 a.m. in Australia and following us and asking questions somehow, uh, came in here doing his PhD and, and came out, but he also provided some really interesting input during the brainstorming session. We got uh, funding from UN Habitat as a seed fund for Nested Phoenix. They were super interested. That allowed us to bring in uh, Associate Professor Georgia Warren Myers and Dr. Victor Boonster into the mix. And that led to the publication of the theoretical framework of Nested Phoenix published on in 2022. So things takes time to make good wine. In 2020, relocated here, moved to the UC Louvain. And uh, great, because in Belgium, the funding agencies listen, unlike in Australia, and they funded the project immediately. So thanks to the FNRS for us to be able to stand in front of you today, because otherwise it's impossible. And thanks to the FNRS, because thanks to the FNRS, I got to meet Katarina and Gildas. So after a very thorough interview process, we were super lucky to have the two stars here that will talk after me. So uh, Katarina is a postdoctoral researcher on the Nessus Phoenix project, provided a lot of the science, a lot of the science behind the dynamic aspects of the model, which is a core value. And Gildas, uh, we tend to call him the magician who tends to pull the uh, rabbits out of Python code and things like this, and you'll see a bit later how it works. We were also super lucky to get Roberto to join us on a visiting PhD uh, from Universal Campagna in Italy. Roberto Bosco, he's helped us a lot with the, the final push of Nested Phoenix, notably modeling different elements and assemblies and how these fit together. And it's great to have someone with an architectural engineering and architectural background doing this work and not someone who doesn't have a clue, which is sometimes the case. We also have Tongi. Thanks, Tongi, for making it. So in the final rush, we got so overloaded with work that we had to ask for extra help outside the team. And luckily, Tongi was here to help us, and Tongi developed the specialization components that you will see on Nested Phoenix to be able to plot things on a map. So thanks a lot. I think through the presentation, you have understood how important your work is. <laughs> Great. And so we are here today for the Nested Phoenix launch, and get ready because it's going to happen. <laughs> so what are we talking about? Uh, it's great to have, of course, Verena and Alex talk before us because a lot of the groundwork is covered, and now we can really hit it on the nail. 
So we'll just start by really looking at the built environment. If we look at the built environments that humans have developed around us, including ourselves, we basically pile, tend to pile things up, uh, put materials together, erect elements into assemblies and put these together to make buildings. And then when we have enough buildings next to each other, we have compound cities that sprawl over thousands of square kilometers. And then we also have the green infrastructures that surround it, and that was here before us. Let's not forget. So trees, soils, parks, gardens, etc. Across all these scales, we have flows of energy, water, greenhouse gas emissions, mass, cost, and so on and so forth. And to try to understand these things, this is these are the different generations that you mentioned that was reviewed in 2013. We developed individual models. We developed models for materials, models for assemblies, thermal models up to the building level. We have mobility models at the city level. We have uh, forestry models to manage the ecosystem and so on and so forth. So we like to do this humans. We like to go each one in their way. But this is a problem because this gives a siloed and fragmented view of the built environment. And we focus on one scale and we forget the others, or we focus on the higher scales and we forget the lower ones. And so nested Phoenix is the opposite of that. Nested Phoenix is about developing a holistic model that integrates all these different scales of the built environment, introduces a life cycle perspective over time, and uses the power of the computation and Python programming in particular to be able to interlink all these models together. So if you make one decision at one scale, it flows across all the other scales. The good thing is that it's modular. So if you're not interested in going all the way up to neighborhoods, you can still work at the building level and have the same model do the same calculations in the same consistent way for you. Why do we do this? As we said, and as you mentioned, and as Alex mentioned, it's critical to understand how we build cities because we tend to do things without understanding what we're doing. And then, hey, by the way, uh, what was the damage done because we built this this way? So the idea is that if you want to do this today, you can. All right, good luck. It's extremely data intensive, time intensive, extremely costly, and therefore it's often one shot. So Emily here has done a lot of work on reviewing existing material stock studies around the world. And very often it's OK, we came up, we put the data, we crunched the numbers. This is the result. And then we look at the other one. Oh, the method is different. The data source is different. It's inconsistent. And that's normal. This science is starting to emerge. It's not something like structural engineering that's been here for a few hundred years. But this is what we want to go over. So we want to go over this one shot, expensive and time intensive approach to an automated approach. And I put a semi automated here because you can still override some of the calculations to enable upscaling, reduce time and reduce costs associated with developing this. This is what Nested Phoenix does. Now, what Nested Phoenix try to do is to tackle different challenges. So we have all these scales of the built environment. It's a little bit crazy huh? when it's nice to have these clockworks turning, but how do you do it? All right. The three main challenges that we try to address are complexity, dynamic nature of the built environment, and the data intensiveness that you've mentioned. So it's extremely complex. We have things happening at different scales nested into each other, things that change over time, and it's increasing, and we have people flying in, and it's really very, very complicated. So we try to, we try, and trying is important here. We don't, it's not a solution. It's, it's a path towards potentially one day a solution. We mitigate complexity with comprehensiveness. So we try to be as exhaustive as we can, to try to capture all these inter different interlinkages so that if you make a decision at one life cycle stage at one point in time, you can see the repercussion across space and time of what you did. This is why we also spatialize. We introduce and you'll see quite advanced features to do dynamic forecasting to try to predict the future. So it is a crystal ball science here, but you can at least run scenarios. If at some point the EU tries to agree on scenarios coming up in terms of benchmarking, decreasing things, and Damian, you're doing some work in the space, then hopefully we can start to say, okay, well, we want to meet this target. Let's see if the grid evolves in this way. Where do we end up? And how does this affect the design? How does this affect the built environment? And we try to mitigate data intensiveness or intensity with a lot of use of archetyping where possible and default values. So. The model is bottom up, you have guessed it. It's parametric as I've been advocating and therefore it's extremely data intensive. But instead of asking you to input everything every time, 
a lot of the data is pre-populated, but if you know the value, you can change it. That's the approach. So the model has all the containers for us to model things in a very accurate way. But if we don't have the data accurate in a very good way, we still have a good guess way out. It's not, oh yeah, we're stuck. So we try to mitigate it in this way. So the theoretical framework combines a nested systems approach, nesting materials into elements, into assemblies, into buildings and infrastructures, into neighborhoods and cities. It takes a life cycle assessment approach across the different life cycle stages of buildings with different uh, inputs and outputs and dynamic modeling. So retrospective and prospective through time to develop the theoretical framework of nested Phoenix. Now, what does the Phoenix see? What is the scope? We take into account embodied environmental flows associated with materials, building infrastructure, assets and uh, utilities. We take into account operational flows associated with heating, cooling, ventilation, lighting, hot water, as well as cooking and appliances, as well as water use in the building. We take transport, so mobility flows into account, both with private and public infrastructure asset, both direct requirements, so burning fuel in an engine, as well as indirect requirements, the embodied energy of your car, of your tramway, of the rails on which the tramway is, is moving. And we take into account carbon sequestration into trees and soils that are deployed on the area or on the gardens that you have at the back of your building. So this is the full scope of what Nested Phoenix sees. Right? It doesn't mean it sees everything, <laughs> unfortunately. Now, how do we move and how do we model these buildings? We use five different shapes that are parametric. So you can modify the dimensions of each one of these edges on these shapes. So we have five polygons to try and approximate shapes that we get typically from a GIS pipeline. We have some codes that we just wrote that optimizes the shapes and fits the shape according to its area and perimeter, which are the two determinant dimensions of a building shape or geometry. We have the height that comes in from GIS, so not only footprints, and then we use rules of sum to infer build of quantities for each building in the stock. These rules of sum, there are a few of them. So we have 65 different construction assemblies defined at the building level. We have 11 different assemblies defined as a park and square level. We have nine different assemblies for a transport infrastructure level and six different assemblies for utility. So in total, we have 92 different construction assemblies for which we generate quantities on the fly. So you give us a rectangle, you tell us it's six meters high, it's a residential building. And then we tell you, okay, how much there are windows, columns, uh, beams, uh, foundations, uh, et cetera. We need to provide a little bit more info. So how many stories underground, et cetera. So not just the shape, maybe plus eight parameters. And from this, we infer the rest. But we infer the rest based on other proxy parameters that you can change. So if you're not happy with the outcome, you can go and say, oh, in this one, I only have one large boiler for the whole building instead of us putting instantaneous boilers for your hot water based on our algorithm. So you can override this logic. This leads us with the quantities that we found to embodied flows. We use for now the EPIC database as a, as a foundation for the calculation because it's the only database of hybrid embodied environmental flows in the world for construction materials at the moment. Uh, and then we take these materials, we put them into different construction elements, such as bricks, uh, insulation, that we put into different construction assemblies, that we put into different buildings, which we put on a plot, and we do the same thing for infrastructure assets. And then we can also plant trees in the garden or alongside roads, and a built stock is basically a list of all these different buildings and all these different infrastructures that are on it. That's how it works. So we calculate everything on a building by building level. We take into account embodied energy emissions, water. We take into account the mass of materials, the volume. We have a tentative cost of materials, but I put it into big, two big square brackets there. It's just tentative for now. What is interesting is because we use EPIC and because I co-developed EPIC with Rob Crawford and Fabian Prido, and I have access to all the data, we also implemented calculations that compute what we call the input output remainder dynamically. So this is getting super technical here. But what it means is that when we replace the insulation in 20 years, we take into account all the indirect requirements associated with replacing the insulation on top of the material requirement. So how much energy was spent for the insurance companies that insured the contractor to come put the insulation in your house is taken into account using this approach. 
To my knowledge, this is the only time this has been done dynamically on the replacement of each element, element by element in history. We have done it previously at the whole building level and allocated it, but now the calculation is done at an element level with matrices and calculations, input output calculations on every. We also take into account the replacement of materials over time using default service lines. You can link elements together. So if one is replaced, the other is replaced as well. So you force replacements. And uh, we have wastage on site that is also taken into account through the wastage coefficients. Moving on to operational, we have data that comes from the city in terms of heating and cooling degree hours. We use basic thermal, uh, static thermal modeling to you know, have estimates of final heating and cooling. We get delivered through the efficiencies. We developed a, a whole schedule pattern uh, with uh, Katarina, Gildas, and Roberto to be able to model different appliances. So you can switch them on and off, put them on standby for certain hours of the week or the, of the weekend, etc. And based on all of this, we get delivered and primary energy and emissions, as well as total water supply into the building, including losses in the water distribution system. And the schedules have different types, as I mentioned, so we can provide a lot of fine grain modeling. Coming to the mobility flows, we have uh, passenger kilometers that come from typically statistics around areas. And then we have the people that live in the building and uh, we check what transport modes they use, and we have direct and indirect intensities for these flows. And so it's again, in terms of energy, emissions, and water. So here data starts to become super scarce. So the, to my knowledge, one there are maybe three papers in the world that try to calculate the indirect water requirements of transport. One of them I wrote with uh, Rob Crawford. And we estimate, for example, how much water is needed to move one person by a train in Melbourne. And so this is the water needed to make the electricity, to make the train, to make the rails, etc. So this is, we're starting to push. OK, like we want to model this, but you end up using data that's 20 years old that lens and put together for Australia or us for, uh, for water, etc. For biogenic carbon, we make trees grow in nested Phoenix. We have uh, two kinds of trees, either hardwood or softwood trees. And it has three growth rates, so high, medium, and low. So this is coming from the United States Department of Energy. It's again, very old. I think it's a 1998 model, but it's one of the very few models that we found that works well. Uh, and we have soils that saturate over time. So they don't sequestrate carbon the whole time. It's not a linear curve. So they use a saturation exponential curve. After a certain amount of years, they don't sequestrate carbon. Anymore. Now, in our model, trees don't die. That's uh, one of the limitations. So trees grow on forever. So if one day you want to place this things and you try to put a thousand years of period of analysis, your trees in the last 10 years will start sequestrating like infinite amount of carbon. Yeah, I wish it was true. We also have some experimental flows that we put in there, but we didn't really look uh, in a lot of depth into making it work in details. These are the biogenic carbon stocks in uh, bio-based products. So we use the coefficients from Levasseur, and you get a snapshot of what's currently in your stock in terms of biogenic carbon. Now, of course, this will come out at some point, so we follow the one plus one minus one approach in general. But if you are interested to check, okay, in this stock, how much there is biogenic carbon, uh, sorry, yeah, carbon sequestrated in bio-based materials, you can have this, this figure. It's not hidden. We also model carbonation in concrete, but it's worth peanuts. And we try to come up with a service life balance. Uh, and you'll see why later. This is linked to the forecasting and uh, let's say crystal ball approach of Nested Phoenix. So Nested Phoenix enables you to, and this is quite new in general to the different models you've seen, we can parametrically modify or extend the service lives of materials. So you just put a coefficient. I want my material, my elements to last 20% longer than what effect does this have on the recurrent emissions, replacement rates, et cetera? 20% less. You can also, and this is really interesting for refurbishment and renovation, modify through time assemblies by others. So let's say we want to improve the energy efficiency of buildings in European building stock. We say, okay, we have this cohort of buildings we have modeled as this archetype, and then we want to modify these walls by walls with insulation. The code will remove similar elements, so you don't double count it because you're putting something that you already have, and it will add the insulation. 
and this will change the U value of your wall in your calculation. So you get a trajectory with uh, energy use like this, the U value changes, it flattens out. You can also replace, uh, I don't know, your boiler by a boiler that's more efficient. I'm looking at you, Sebastian, because you, you're the systems guy. Um, and so you can you can model these in either a single change or also in a chain change. So you can replace one wall by the other, and then this wall that replace this one, you replace it by another, and so on. So you can cascade your changes over time and model a, a stock that is changing over time as well. And you can also install at some year renewable energy systems. So you can add PV or add solar thermal to existing buildings that kick in from a certain year. So we, we are not stuck with whatever we have at the start. You can kind of change what you have with you because buildings last so long. So in total, we have uh, on top of this, you can evolve certain values in the model over time. So you can provide evolution curves, cubic, uh, linear, etc. And you can modify the embodied energy emissions, water intensity, the, the heating and cooling degree days to model climate change, the appliances energy use, the primary energy coefficient for electricity, the emissions factor for electricity, the indirect emissions and water and whatever for mobility transports, the transport model mix, so how much we use of each transport mode, the distance traveled. The total of 14 key parameters can be evolved individually in Nested Phoenix. And you can start to, to see how this affects the whole model and the dynamic going forward. And that's it for me for now. So now I just wanted to leave the floor to Gildas to go quickly over what Nested Phoenix is as a model. And he's probably the best person in the world to talk to you about that. So. <laughs> So in terms of, uh, of what Nested Phoenix is implemented as a, a website. Uh, and so in the very far back end of this website is a database uh, powered by PostgreSQL because PostgreSQL has great capabilities to store uh, GIS data with, with GIS. Um, this is then connected into a uh, Django and Python backend. This Python is used by a lot of people, especially in research. Uh, and so, yeah, the idea is that the code it's not just there to make things work and to be executed, but also for people to be able to read it, to further collaborate. Uh, and then this Django backend is connected, uh, wired into a front-end interface uh, implemented in React. Uh, but potentially, yeah, the idea in, in this uh, environment of a, this growing environment of, a, of many tools, uh, the idea would be maybe to be able to cut uh, between the front end and back end and also use instant Phoenix calculations uh, as an API. Um, all of this is orchestrated by Docker, so this is go good for uh, reproducibility. So if you have a computer and you don't uh, don't have access to this database because we haven't uh, hosted it yet, <laughs> you can just take the code on your computer and have uh, a running version of everything with the database, the back end, the front end, and everything that works. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, our key principles are it has to be pedagogical. So that's why we chose Python. Uh, and also, in the way we implemented things in Python, uh, we map uh, the reality. So we have uh, an ESD consultant that gets information from a quantity surveyor. And so, yeah, the, the classes reflect a bit uh, how things work. Um, the aim is for it to be collaborative. So if any people uh, here code a bit, you're welcome to uh, contribute to, to the future of, uh, of Nested Phoenix. And yeah, finally, we try to apply best practice uh, all the way with clean code, etc. I'll now leave the, the ground to uh, Katarina to talk about the case study that, uh, that we use. Thank you, Gildas. Thank you, Gilbert. Thanks, Andre. So um, I will talk about the case study. So we are in Belgium, northern uh, west part of the Europe, and Belgium has uh, three regions: so Flanders, Wallonia, and Brussels. So this is where uh, we are. Um, from Bruges, I found this um, aquarelle map. I liked it very much. So it's a nice way to show that Brussels has 19 municipalities. And then they are further uh, divided into 724 statistical districts. So we were searching for 
one or two statistical districts uh, just to find a neighborhood where we can have a good distribution of different building types and buildings constructed in different time periods. And for this, we um, relied and filtered uh, Belgian cadastral data, which has information, which has a lot of information, uh, but mainly we used, we filtered uh, information on building uses, uh, numbers of floors and uh, buildings constructed in 14 different time periods. So after comparing and searching, we uh, selected two statistical sectors in UCL. Uh, and this is uh, our case study. So what can I say? Uh, we are modeling six or we are analyzing six, 675 buildings, 7,800 meters of streets and more than one hectare of parks. So our scope, we are modeling embodied flows, energy, greenhouse gas emissions, water and materials, operational flows, energy, greenhouse gases and water, mobility related flows, again, energy and greenhouse gases, carbon sequestration, carbonation um, and taking into account two evolutions, so primary energy factors, uh, evolutions and emissions factors, evolutions. So to do this um, modeling, we relied on a very rich uh, data, GIS database, uh, Belmap. So uh, Belmap, Belmap contains data on uh, uses of buildings, uh, construction periods, and uh, number of occupants, different geometrical characteristics and properties of the building itself and uh, on the garden. So um, we were lucky to have such a rich database, but what happens with GIS data is that very often there are a lot of inconsistencies and just missing data. It's, um, it's very difficult to map out in a realistic way uh, the, any, any case study built environment. So what we did is uh, we visited the site, we went there and tried to see, to talk to people, to ask when buildings were constructed, since we had to answer some questions, like um, we had more than 100 uh, buildings with unspecified use. We didn't know uh, when buildings were, uh, what were the time periods they belonged to and so on. So uh, we found a lot of answers. We uh, tried to classify the buildings, not only uh, residential and mixed use buildings, but also primary schools, high schools, industrial buildings, waste processing plant, um, cultural buildings, uh, and streets as well. Uh, we, we managed to group the streets in four different archetypes, um, anywhere having the streets with uh, tramway lines, with rows of trees, uh, with finishing as asphalt or natural stone. Uh, and the parks, so one more than one hectare of parks. So finally, what we did is um, we took Belmap data, uh, we matched and filled in the gaps, and then we distributed this data uh, proportionally to the uh, number of buildings within uh, construction periods defined by uh, by Belgian cadastral data. And we defined finally 30 archetypes within residential mixed use and non-residential uh, use. Uh, and after doing some analysis uh, of gross floor area constructed in different time periods, we can see here that maybe the highest share uh, belongs to around 30,000 square meters, belongs to high rise buildings, followed uh, by single family or single dwelling houses constructed uh, from 1981 to 90 and 1919 to 1940. But so the main part of the job was, in fact, developing uh, archetypes for these buildings. So how do we how do we classify them? So we have uh, we developed 30 uh, building archetypes. So we define archetypes as groups of parameterized assembly per type of an asset. So here a building. So this massive Excel uh, has uh, in its columns, so each column is one archetype, uh, and then each row uh, belongs to one of uh, 10 assembly categories, uh, which are, so now I have to read this, sorry, structures, walls, windows and barriers, roofs, floors and paving, stairs and ramp, uh, ramps, 
bedroom fits out, accessories, trees and soils, heating system, cooling system, ventilations, electrical and el electronic systems, water system, renewable energy systems, lighting and uh, customs, custom uh, assemblies. And then we developed uh, 66 assembly types. So this includes one more, which is a custom assembly, uh, such as uh, floor slabs, external, internal wall, party walls, uh, different uh, uh, types of foundations, roofs, trusses, and so on. So finally, we have for all of our archetypes more than 1,500 data entries. And if we zoom out to try to see and map out one archetype, uh, you can see uh, here maybe the, the 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 glimpse of granularity of data, um, and on an example of nested elements within uh, the window assembly, I will hand it over to Roberto to continue on the nestedness. Thanks. Uh, an assembly, in effect, consists of multiple elements that are quantified based on its functional unit. Those elements that make up the assemblies have different estimated uh, um, service lives, like Andre said, and these require consideration about their interdependence when a replacement becomes necessary. Becomes necessary, sorry. For instance, within a, a window assembly that we see certain elements like the lintel that may be um, composed by uh, concrete and uh, steel uh, reinforcement uh, are considered um, are assigned a service life that is equal to the one of the building. So uh, therefore um, will not be replaced. On the other hand, if the replacement uh, of one element entails the destruction of another element of the assembly, uh, they are deemed as non-detachable and will be replaced according to the uh, shortest replacement schedule. The characteristics of the elements were um, acquired from manufacturers' data sheets and CAD drawings, uh, and also by um, direct survey. And the data regarding the material, the material composition of the elements were uh, acquired, were extracted from the EPIC database as source. Elements, also elements can consist of one of, or more materials. Uh, for example, the glass is characterized uh, solely by its uh, material um, of, of glass, while a window frame, for example, <laughs> Will, get, will consist of its primary material and the uh, generally the insulation uh, material that it presents inside of it. So um, each element uh, is assigned a specific um, uh, functional unit and the uh, quantities of materials are calculated accordingly. And this, of course, results in a nested model. Uh, this example demonstrates also the level of detail achieved by the model, uh, which goes so far as to describe uh, elements such handles, hinges, screws, nuts, bolts. And, and now uh, for the <laughs> funny part, I give back the mic to Andre that we, is going to give us a sneaky peek of the beta uh, version of the nested Phoenix model interface. Thanks, Roberto. All right, so now I think we're, it's time uh, we're going to broadcast a different screen. And uh, it's the moment you're probably waiting for. So we're going to show you Nestle Phoenix live and in action. Uh, trust me, uh, we haven't seen it much live and in action ourselves. So uh, <laughs> we'll see how the beta version works, but uh, it does work. So yeah, exactly. Um, did you? Yeah, I need to take this. Uh, yeah, 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 no worries. So when you load Nested Phoenix up, this is what you see. Let me just try to use Teams. Thank you, Microsoft. 
product. So this is what you see when you land on the nested Phoenix on the nested Phoenix page, but this is a better. So right now you don't see this when you go to nestedphoenix.com. Yet this is to come. Uh, so basically, you have two main, uh, three main tabs of interface. The first one is a database tab, which provides you access to all the different objects in nested Phoenix and how they are defined. So if we go to assemblies, for example, which is a pretty good place to start, you have a list of all the different assemblies that uh, are modeled. So thanks to Katarina and Roberto for all the super hard work to do this. But then if you click on one, you actually have access to the different elements within it, as well as the breakdown of the different embodied flows. If you click on the element, you go into what materials are inside and so on and so forth. So you can delve and open your Russian doll and see what's inside. And at the end, you get a candy. No, I wish. But uh, this is uh, how far you can drill through. So this database interface is for editing and for viewing. If you want to create something new, you go into the new tab. Not very hard to find. And then you can create any of the objects that you just saw in the database. This provides you with controls. So if you go, for example, to the assembly one to be consistent or the element, you have a different controls that enable you to select different inputs. What is the assembly name, the type, the category, etc. But then you can add, for example, certain elements, and this uh, opens up different models and uh, and and uh, types. For, spe for specific systems, and uh, thanks again to Sebastian doing this PhD and forcing us to think about building systems. Uh, so you can define an efficiency on the system. You can define an energy vector. So is it uh, electricity powered, diesel powered, gas powered, etc.? And this helps us calculate primary energy requirements later on. But the most interesting bit probably is the analysis. So in the analysis tab, you can define an assessment. So uh, because you've done all the hard work and defined everything beforehand, <laughs> that's the, the big, that's where it, it, becomes, it feels good. You just need to select whatever, whatever you want to assess, uh, specify a start year and an end year of assessment, load up some evolutions and maybe scenarios, and then you can run it. So we will run a building for you a bit later on, but uh, for now we want to show you what comes out of the different uh, Assessment. So running the case studies that Katarina described in detail, uh, this is what comes up. So the first thing we wanted to show you is the line chart component. So if we look here at the total uh, energy demand, including, so if you can put the greenhouse gas emissions uh, in those. Yeah. So let's see how that takes. It takes some time to do. So this is this has 666 uh, buildings almost in the background that is churning through to go fetch the data and plot it here. But what you can see, because we have such a long timeline, the embodied flow jumps on the screen, I'll show here, um, are relatively tiny on demand. Here you have in the 1950s and 60s, here you have a big leap between this this uh, line and the other. This corresponds to the construction of a lot of new buildings. Similarly, there was a massive development in that neighborhoods that took place at the late 19, 20 teens. And again, you have a big leap into the embodied energy. So this is what this graph is showing over here. Um, we are, this is still again, loading for the, the, the kilograms of CO2 equivalent. We have run the script for now, but we still have to parallelize it on different cores. So. So here it is. So that's the, the greenhouse gas emissions. You see that in terms of emissions, the leaps uh, that are linked to embodied emissions are a bit more pronounced. You can uh, use the controls up there, but again, in terms of time, we would not. But you can specify different functional units that you can slice the data by the gross floor areas, the volume of the buildings, the square kilometers of your neighborhood, etc. This is the most basic things that we have. You can also change the units on the left hand side if they are not what you like. Moving on from here, we move on to something that is a little bit more exciting, which is the uh, map that enables us to uh, visualize and spatialize where things are. So again, thanks, Tongi. Now you can see it in action. So uh, this is the, the plugin that is used to spatialize the result. So right now we're looking at the total uh, mass of the building. And we see that we have a few buildings that weigh a little bit more than the others, typically because they have more stories and slabs represent them. But most importantly, 
uh, you can slice that. So we're not going to plot it now, but you can go and say, OK, well, I'm interested in seeing how this looks like by assembly category, by a material type. I want to go to see the metals. So how do how much how much do the metals weigh in each building? How much do whatever? And so this is uh, how it looks for metals. We have a minimum of six tons here, up to 18 tons of metals in a particular building. And so you can slice the data cube in any way you want. This is the, the level of granularities that we deploy. You can even slice the time on the left hand side. You say, well, I'm interested in this time period. What is available then, etc. And moving on to this temporal dimension, uh, we want to also show another data visualization that we put together for you, which is the age pyramid of material. So we developed this for the Melbourne case study that took us five days <laughs> to be able to make one. Now it takes maybe 30 seconds to make one. So that's the, the ratio of what the value of Nestle Phoenix does. Uh, this is going back very far up in time across the timeline. The build stock here itself, whenever a building is built, we are not destroying it yet. Right? We, can, we can make scenarios later to pull out the building and make the code handle it. But for now, you put the building in, it stays until the end. So you start with few buildings and then it accumulates over time, right? Which is typically what happens because, okay, we have had periods of large scale demolitions, but if things continue like the way we are trying to do things in the EU, we are not looking at a lot of demolitions anymore. We are looking at a lot of keeping the stock and then maintaining the stock exactly like you mentioned. And so this will be priceless. On the left hand side, you see concrete. This is the mass of concrete uh, materials. And this is the mass of all other materials. And typically concrete weighs at least as much as all the rest and sometimes a lot of times more. But it depends on where you are and you can have timber that weighs a lot as well. Et cetera. If we go down to the bottom of this pyramid, and we look a little bit at the, the materials that are here. You see tiny fractions of materials that don't appear later on in the age. These are materials that don't last long. So you don't find, I don't know, carpet that is super old in your stock because this carpet has been replaced. It doesn't permeate into the upper levels of the pyramid. What you find at the top of the pyramid is things that last. Concrete, steel, timber, stone, uh, mortar, etc. And you know, when you see this, it's a bit reassuring. You're like, oh, okay, we didn't screw up too much. So this is the data visualization that we put together. And the last one we wanted to show you is obviously the, the Sankey diagram. So what we're going to do here is to run an assessment on the spot for a single building um, and uh, to show you uh, the, the, time, the time assessment. I think you can yeah, go up to 2050 or something like this. Yeah, great. And, um, we're going to display that, I think, for embodied flows. So for a single building, it goes relatively fast. And we can select the, the total embodied, the total embodied energy. Yeah, that's good. And this is what Nested Phoenix is capable of producing on the spot. So uh, we can do this for operational and mobility as well. We're not going to do it now because I broke the code not so long ago, so sorry for that. <laughs> but um, the idea is that we, you can do it for each one alone and you can do it for one that stitches everything at the same time. So you can then compare, for example, the total greenhouse gas emissions associated with using your modem to the greenhouse gas emissions associated with replacing the handle of your door at the same time. So it gives you a full panoramic view of your profile of emissions, energy use, water use across embodied transport, sequestration, everything at the same time. And so it's full on. Right? I mean, with this graph, we can spend uh, like a day just trying to interpret what's happening here. You can see that the input output remainder represents a significant share of embodied energy. This is generally zero in most studies done around the world because they use process data. You even have a categorization about initial and recurrent that is linked to all the different material and, and element categories. So initial, this is what we put at the start of the building. This is for replacing elements over time. If you start playing with the replacement scenarios, you start to have a lot of replacement of recurrent because you're maintaining your stock. As your stock lasts, this shrinks in proportion and this increases. So it's also an interesting dynamic at play over time. Voila, uh, I'm going to stop here because we're getting a little bit late with time. Apologies for that, but yeah, there's a lot to cover. So that was the last data visualization that we wanted to show you.
And uh, what I'll do now is to just simply, uh, I have two more slides to go or three, and then we can wrap it up. So let me try to understand what I'm doing. Yeah. Good. So hopefully on Teams you can see the slides again. What we are implementing as well. So this is a lot of data to handle, and you probably are super keen to get your hands on the data, not only on the data visualization. And we know that because we often want to get our hands on the data as well. So we are developing also a data dump feature. So with one click, you can get all the data that is behind an assessment that is generated as an Excel with a table of contents with a sheet per main data frame. And this is a sample of what the data looks like for embodied flows. So you have for every year, every urban area, every building, every assembly, every element, the scope of what you're looking at, every material, the mass, the volume, the embodied energy emissions. So this is a few thousand lines long for one building. So for the neighborhood, it's a few million rows, but that's the data intensiveness that we were talking about. This is why when Gilles presses on the button, draws a new map and we're like, damn it, it's taking too long. It's hundreds of millions of rows that are being churned out in the back end to be able to displace this. So, yeah, once we deploy it on a server, then it's going to be different. But on our laptops, the poor laptop, yeah, I think uh, we, we, did, we did not acknowledge the laptops, but they deserve an acknowledgement. All right. Because nested Phoenix is a model, it is only an approximation of reality. I think we can all agree that the numbers coming out from Nested Phoenix are not the most accurate numbers in the world. That's not the purpose of Nested Phoenix. The purpose of Nested Phoenix is the comprehensiveness. And still, despite this, there are, for example, flows that are not considered systematically and thoroughly, like costs which can drive decision making significantly. And we talked about environmental impacts, so not only primary energy flows or primary flows, some are not correlated with the flow. So, for example, ozone depletion is correlated with the kind of coolants that you might be leaking, but is not very much correlated with embodied energy. So, this is important to take into account. Thanks again, Sebastian, for the insight. The other thing that comes to mind here is the different resolutions that we have for the different models. So, the embodied flows are modeled in an extremely accurate way. To my understanding, this is one of the most sophisticated models ever created to compute embodied energy with remainders and nested. Now, like it's it's too long. But when we move on to operational transport and sequestration, you don't see it very well anymore. The the models lose in resolution. So we are not pretending that hey, it's amazing, it does everything all the time and it's perfect. No, it's like we try to do things as to the best of what we can in the small amounts that we have to fund this research. But there are significant room for improvement as always. And one of these ways for improvement, and thanks, Alex, for the segue, is maybe we need to stop trying to overcomplicate the physics of making things work and to start relying on uh, AI generated patterns of inferred logic. So, not only us trying to make best guesses of rule of thumbs, et cetera, but use the AI to generate things maybe in a much better and robust way. Uncertainty, we have all the data to model it, but we need to run the model to understand how the uncertainty is in the model to better reflect it. So, it's a bit of a serpent biting its tail, but uh, everything is ready to support it. And finally, well, if uh, the pipeline had two bottlenecks before, one at the GIS processing and the one for the crunching the numbers, Nested Phoenix takes away the bottleneck for processing the data and enabling you to visualize things quickly and to test, but you still have to pre-process the GIS data. And Katarina can tell you a lot about that. Mm -hmm. So where to from here? We're at the launch today. It's uh, mid-2023. We're hoping to release the beta version for this for every one of you here and everyone else on this planet to be able to access for free, including the code by the end of this year. This is the aim. And then sky is the limit. We want to take it. We want to test it across different countries, across different cities, try to better understand the material stocks, build stocks in a consistent and transparent manner and see what comes out of it. So the final aim of this is to have Nested Phoenix act like a star in a planetary system where we have the backend codes that rest in Nested Phoenix and we have different interfaces that are planets that grab it around. But they all subcontract the calculations to Nested Phoenix. And these are the different tools, Alex, that you were talking about before. So all the tools that you mentioned, I think systematically could send the request to Nested Phoenix to do some calculations for them and then display it to the relevant stakeholder in the relevant format. And so to conclude, I think it's relevant that we show you a photo of Shenzhen in China. 
So uh, the mega city you see here, that uh, is for now 15 million plus people at least, used to be a fisherman's village in the 1960s. I'll just let that sink in a little bit. You can look at the photo. So if we are to improve the net life cycle environmental performance of buildings, infrastructure, assets, and cities, we need to models, models that address these complexities that we mentioned before. So we're talking about the complexity itself, the dynamic nature, as well as the data intensities. Best at Phoenix is such a model. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the very impressive work. I'm really looking forward to be able to test it. Yeah, sure. Um, I've done. We will have a number of questions, or is it? Uh... Yeah, no, it's a Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank these guys for the for the amount of work that I don't know about. Maybe I'll just stand up. That doesn't make much difference, but I will say that. Um, just two things uh, I wanted to say. First of all, uh, in 2004, Grand Chalor was the first friend I had in Australia. Rob Crawford was the guy sitting next to me in an office in, in Geelong. And seeing their names 19 years later with a work of this quality tells you that life comes back in circle and actually improves the level where you are. So. Thank you for bringing all that up. So that's the first thing. Second thing, well, Andre, I was, well, Denis as well, on your panel committee when you submitted uh, the work here. And I don't think we could have anticipated what you could have delivered today uh, after just three years that, that you moved to uh, Louvain and Earth. So thank you again for that. And the third, uh, <laughs> sorry, the third is actually uh, a call for responsibility. Uh, I mean, we are at the university. We are educating the designers of the future, but also the decision makers of the future. So uh, in Verema's uh, presentation, you talk about spatial dynamics and temporal dynamics. And I wanted to add human dynamics, how people need to evolve in order to understand certain things. Alexander talked a lot about optimization, optimization, which is priority dependent. So essentially you optimize based on certain aims. And uh, throughout the presentation, I didn't want to interrupt, didn't want to ask questions, but something came back to my mind, which is Formula One drivers. Uh, I'm old. At my age, you know, the Jackie Stewart, Dylan Prost, I mean, what they could do is just to feel the car, try to get out of their sensation how could the car could go faster. And essentially what they were, they were people with very good senses and an understanding of basic mechanics. I mean, look at Formula One now. They are essentially engineers, we're aerospatial engineers, because otherwise they cannot cope with the huge amount of information that they get. More information means that there are more aspects to, to think about, more things that have to be somehow uh, matched up and um, sort of making matchmakings and decisions at the same time, which means that we as educators have the responsibility of getting people to understand all of the complexity that sits behind in order for all of this information to be used effectively. So thank you for that. Thank you. So thanks for the power of very good words. I appreciate it. I'm not sure I deserve it, but I appreciate it. <laughs> thanks. So now we have some uh, room for questions. So I will start perhaps with uh, the audience here. And then if there are some questions from the chat, um, you can uh, tell me so that we can also move uh, to there. Are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you all for this great presentation and the powerful tool that you you've made and developed. Um, it's a question maybe uh, concerning the target group that you reach, because um, as you know, Stefan, because we you were already, um, yeah, you know my work, but uh, the, the question of this urban mining and urban metabolism studies is what do we next do? I mean, for public authorities, uh, we have research, but what then? Um, and we've seen that 
uh, urban metabolism studies that conduct to tools or maybe some uh, regulations are funded by uh, public authorities. So the question here, I'm very excited as a researcher to, to test your tool, but I'm also for the moment a public authorities. And so the question is, how can we use this tool? Um, and because it's very complex, and how can we use it to make good choices in renovation strategies and which kind of, for example, insulation materials um, that we can push and yeah, so to make good choices and. Thanks, Emily. So, so that's that's really good, a very good question. I think uh, Arta will be able to answer some of your questions in two, three years time. Uh, so Arta is doing a PhD on uh, basically using a similar approach to what we present, but for urban mining and reuse and, and things like this and facilitating that for urban redevelopment, so refurbishment. Now, to answer directly your question, I totally hear you. What we are presenting here today is the first interface that comes out of something that is extremely sophisticated, as you saw, but as such, very complicated. Now, in terms of the workflow, we don't have time today to walk you through the input workflow. But if you are someone who is working at Brussels environment today and you want to model an archetype of a maison bourgeoise in Brussels, ideally, through the use of the tool, this tool is a snowball. All right. So today we're launching the snowball from the top of the mountain. And as time passes, the snowball gathers a lot of more snow. The more you use it, the more you model buildings. The more you model buildings, the more the database has assemblies in it, more elements. You want to make sure that people there is a check somewhere. They don't just put garbage in, otherwise you get garbage out. But uh, but this is how it works. So ideally, if if there is a project funded, let's say by Innoviris, a bit like BBSM or taking BBSM and putting it into Nested Phoenix in terms of the archetypes developed, etc., then a decision maker can go select the archetype Maison Bourgeoise, click, they spread it over Brussels, and they can say, okay, this is a typical composition. I want to replace it with this wall. We make a wall with different insulation materials. Now, if I use cellulose, what happens? Yeah. If I use polyurethane, what happens? If I use XPS, what happens? And what happens in terms of material volume, embodied energy, embodied emissions, embodied flows, operational energy, operational emissions, delivered and primers? And probably we already know that as you continue to insulate, it starts to becoming less returns on investment. So maybe it's time to switch to, I don't know, changing your heating system to a heat pump. That's a much better way to put the subsidies in. So you can test a lot of this. Ideally, one develops another interface that calls the calculation engine that we mentioned here and is much more simplified so people can use it. Here you get today the full package. <laughs> so it's a bit like uh, a lot of, you have access to all the parameters. But that's maybe not what everyone needs, right? So we start here because this is how we need it. But then the, the, the API itself, so what we call an API, which is the back end, you can call it with whatever you want. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's compatible with some uh, Belgian tools, such as Totem, such as you, you yeah, need maybe to the bridge, EPB. But yeah, it would be, it would be. If there is funding to build a bridge, yes, there is no problem. We just need to fit the data coming in from Totem to Nested Phoenix, or even Nested Phoenix fetches data from a Totem database. That was the first question I asked Damian three years ago. Mm -hmm. Does Totem have an API? And the answer was no. So okay. The tools themselves yeah, don't have an API. <laughs> no, it's because it's quite <laughs> difficult to to match EPB and Totem. So uh, yeah, that, but, the uh, question was, OK, but there are a lot of tools if they are compatible, great. And if not, sometimes it's difficult. But totally anyway. Um, but here we're giving the handles. So because this is relatively modern in its sense of yeah. development, we open it up and it has the handles. So you can, as an outsider, just connect to the handles and turn right if you want, or drive straight, mm -hmm. whatever you want to do. To take Formula One. And so, yeah, thank you. That so. was for my public authorities part, but I'm really interested to test uh, the tool. Sure. Considering all the works done in BBSM. So, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Mm -hmm. You're on the Thank you. Other question? Yeah. There are a few online after. Yeah. 
Ah, okay, okay. We can. I don't see them. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I don't know if this works. But yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. They can hear you and we can hear you live. Okay, great. There's no echo. Yeah. I just had a question about the indicators that you are considering. So today is mainly about uh, the environmental dimension uh, with uh, embodied uh, carbon and um, yeah, energy use and, and water. And I was wondering if uh, you will consider the social dimension uh, at some stage, because there are some databases uh, available. Yeah. And I think it would be great in the idea of uh, having a comprehensive tool to Definitely. add that dimension as well. Thanks, Sebastian. Yeah, we've worked a lot on Silka together, so we can advocate for the work done at Aachen University and, and uh, Marzia Traverso a lot. Um, yes, so the good news, is that because the model flows systematically from the bottom up, you can add things to your materials. So if today I add a column to my materials that is called potato, I managed to put potato in the presentation. No, but uh, <laughs> let's, uh, and then put values in that, then this will get carried through all the way to the build stock. And actually we did that recently. So volume that you saw here is a very late addition. It was added two months ago. We just say, oh yeah, it would be cool to calculate volume as well. And then enter, it goes up all the way. So as long as we have the data, that's the other thing. So how accurate is the social LCA data today at the material level? I think you can tell us more about that. Maybe not so much. Um, what can we use it for to inform decision making? Uh, is it in our sphere of influence or not? There are a lot of uh, ramifications, but the thing is that the model is expandable. So you can expand it, and we designed it in this way. That was the whole point. So yeah, let's see what time brings us. Mm -hmm. Thanks. We have, have some questions from the chat, yeah. I will um, go through it uh, step by step. So first, let's start with Alexandra Kim from ETH. Uh, her question is about, or did you collect the material data for building components? I don't know if it is a question for you or for Catarina. Maybe Katarina, if you want to take it, or uh, with Roberto, yeah. yeah. There it is. Thank you. So um, we explore a lot of databases, and uh, on the level of the assemblies, we mainly relied on a tabula database, tabula episcope, trying to understand what are the typological buildings belonging uh, to a certain period, time period. Uh, and later we try to match this with totem and understand what are the dimensions, what are the details, how different elements are connected together. So I would say that these two are uh, maybe the main sources. And then of course there was always like, it's it's not easy to find, if you're trying to model a, a tram railway and you need the connector, how much does it weigh? What is the material inside? Uh, what is the mass? Uh, so at the end, you also have to go and search online and go to the production producers uh, to some like super weird websites, but finally you find it. So uh, like it's a never ending process searching for, for data, but I would say, uh, Totem being the primary one as well as Pablo. And yeah. probably also based on side visits that yeah. you have. Yes, of course. On, uh, of course. From data. Yeah, of course. And yeah. in the model, we have uh, provided fields. So for every data input that you put, there is always a comments box somewhere. You can always find it. So you can document everything thoroughly. That is the pedagogical replicability, transparency, et cetera, approach that we have. So when you open up something, and someone else has done it, you can actually go in and read and check, okay, this is what is inside this, uh, I don't know, wall, this is what we assume, this is where it comes from, the source, etc. All right, thank have, you very uh, much for your um, answer. Next question from Nicola Francar. Um, you mentioned that during the presentation, you mentioned that it would be possible to contribute to the yep. project somehow. And uh, his question is, will there, will there be um, a viable code on GTube or similar? That's sure. the first question. And also if the recording of this session will be available. Yeah, sure. Do you want to take the GitHub question, Gilles? It That's what we use so far. So it's already on GitHub. It's just a matter of making it public once we are ready to, yeah. Uh, yeah. Definitely. So it's already living on the cloud. This is mm -hmm. how, otherwise it's impossible for us to collaborate and work. It's a lot of pushing and pulling for the 
for the people who are well acquainted with these terms. In terms of the recording, I did press the record button. I did press it a little bit late. So Verena, I'm really sorry, but I pressed it immediately after I went there. I was like, Damn. so that's recording from then onwards. And the idea is to make this recording available. That was agreed with Verena and with Alex and not with you guys, but sorry, but with us. Uh, but yeah, we will we will try to make this publicly available since it is a public event. Yeah. Then we have a question from Dominique, uh, my, my offer from uh, Theo Graz. Yeah. Uh, he was asking if it was always required to manually gather the information about the buildings in the study area. So, for example, the construction year, the usage, etc. Ah, so should I repeat? Yes. Yeah. So he was asking if it was uh, always required to manually gather the information about the buildings in the study area. Uh, well, I would say, yeah, thanks. So we were trying to uh, gather the information that was missing or uh, from from a GIS database or the information that had high uncertainty. So uh, it is true when you have a map with uh, 100 unspecified buildings, you have to go out and you have to talk to people to ask when was this constructed. Of course, a lot of things you can uh, guess, but uh, ideally, uh, well, I mean, I, ideally we can go and map everything, but we don't have the, the time or, or the resources to do this. So um, what we did is that um, we relied on proportion of buildings within the cadastral data and proportion of buildings belonging to different time periods. So when you have uh, 14 different time periods grouping buildings in a certain way, uh, after matching this uh, collected data and documented data for from uh, the case study and from the visit to the site. The rest is just proportionally allocated by following uh, uh, a reference and a model. Mm -hmm. I would just add to this that the GIS data is highly inconsistent. Mm -hmm. So for some buildings, you have a detailed year of construction and uses. It's looking good. You go, you check. It's great. For the building just next door, it's a total mess. It's unspecified. There's no construction year. Also, we found out that it was built in 2015. Like it's the easiest building to find construction year. There were missing buildings because they use the satellite imagery to infer them. Katarina picked up that buildings with green roofs were not picked up as buildings because they were not being detected by their algorithms as buildings. So they will go there. <laughs> Where is this? Like, uh, so yeah, it's it's fun. We think yeah, the tech will do everything, but there's still nothing like a field visit uh, to go there and check things and have a chat and see how things are used and check exactly the materials, etc. So in response to this, you can decide to use only the GIS data and whatever publicly available or non-publicly available data without going there in person. All the issue with this is a significant level of added uncertainty that you add to your model because there might be things that deviate significantly from reality then. And then we have a, a final question from Camille van der Waren. Um, so she is asking first, what are the differences between building typologies in different regions modeled? Uh, or are there at this time only Belgian building typologies modeled? All right, so the, the current database of Nested Phoenix only contains this case study that you've seen. We have also taken some time to migrate previous assemblies from the ancestor model in Australia to this. The current embodied calculations you saw today are based on EPIC on the Australian database. They are not based on the Belgian data because this is how the model is built. You can put other data in the back end. Nothing, I mean, everything is super flexible. You can put in whatever you want and model whatever you want. And this is the snowball that I was talking about. So today it's the start. Right? But if uh, Camille is interested in one modeling this with Sintef in Norway. Uh, then, yeah, of course, you can spend some time. Or we can talk to maybe uh, Karim Dosle, who's also at Sintef and who's done some interesting work in the field. Takes the archetypes of Karim that she described in her papers, puts them into Nested Phoenix, and then we start to have one centralized database of buildings, archetypes, assemblies, elements that is international and consistent in structure and coverage and the way things are calculated. So yeah, at the moment it's just this, but as I mentioned in the timeline, it's bound to grow significantly. 
And the second question was, can the tool be used to model the flaws for completely new urban developments? Yeah. So what we didn't show here is that on the build stock assessment, you don't need GIS systematically. There is a simplified thing which we've been doing, the Anster model did, which is unspecialized build stock. And then it's much simpler. You define archetypes, you tell us how many of this building you have, and then you multiply and then you move on. I mean, it's, uh, you don't get the map, you do get the other data viz. You can inform decision making for sure. But yeah, that's the, the limits of, of how that would work. I think we are here very interested in the question of data scarcity um, and how we would bring this into another city by linking with that. So the, the, what you mentioned about the uncertainty, you know, you were using the Belmap data, which is very intensive if you like no, in comparison to other scenarios and other, other cities so if you were to apply the same kind of uh, statistical two statistical zones with a very scarce uh, scenario with basic gis data let's say about building heights and footprints and so how would the, the results vary we know I, I understand this is kind of uh also inferred data in a way uh, the map but and that you may have buildings that don't exist, yeah. but it still is quite luxurious. Data, yeah, yeah. No? it is very data rich. Yeah. yeah, definitely. That's a very good question. And this is a very big problem. Um, I know that Tomer Fishman is trying to look at that at Leiden University in terms of remote sensing through night sky radiation from cities and light lights to approximate material stocks based on how much light a city emits at night. So the more light, the more material logic. But uh, he, he develops uh, super intensive uh, AI generated algorithms that uh, do regression analysis on the pixels, et cetera, to try and approximate this. And why am I talking about that? Because most of the new developments and developments to come are going to happen in the global south today, the so called global south. And so this is an issue because at the same time, it's data poor in comparison to here. And so it's uh, how do we inform these if we don't have the data to, to to get to this level? My problem with data poor uh, scenarios is that the level of assessment remains coarse. Even here at the building level, with all the work we try to do, we are we still have uncertainties that is not negligible at all. Imagine, I mean, then it means nothing to plot at the building level. You need to plot at a parcel level, but then. It's really super high level, even though the model is bottom up, but because you, you can't really be sure you need to aggregate and then you lose the power of, of using such model for what it's designed. Now. It's again, there is a lot of work being done today with AI, OK, to, to try and get different uh, layers of information and triangulate and then fill in all the gaps and try to get a much richer, enrich the data in this way. So this is what I would try to pursue if I am in a data scarce environment, to use the data that I have and make it work in a better way by interpolating and trying to reach a triangulated, triangulated points that actually make sense to other algorithms. Because trying to collect additional data, you can, that's the best, but by the time we have done so, the planet is already gone. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. yeah um, so first of all, congratulations um, to the whole team. I mean, there's so many applications that one can imagine how to use it. I was wondering if you also had in mind, and I guess that kind of fills on previous comments, that if this also could be applied in a kind of performance targeted way, so to understand what would be the perfect city, the perfect neighborhood, considering all these parameters that you have in the model and then through that help inform decision making in the global south for new urbanization. Thanks, Verena. That's a super valid point. So that's something we thought about. Of course, I mean, <laughs> at the end, we were like, OK, we need to like pick our battles, right? Like, but what we built in the way it's built, it's designed to handle all these things. And this is one of the other reasons that we didn't mention why the cluster methods around people, so jobs. So in the backend code, 
you have a quantity surveyor that takes your building, calculates the quantities, gives it to a built asset manager. The built asset manager calculates when things are replaced. Then they give this to the SD consultant. The SD consultant computes the embodied operation, and then they give this to the data analyst, which then provides the data visualization. This is the code, so it works. When you do code like this, we can constrain the parameters. So we can say, okay, what, how much can we improve things by just acting on the quantity surveyor? So the parameters that the quantity surveyor manages, this is the pool. So, okay, the geometry. So this is linked a little bit more to the design, uh, etc. What about the material choices? Uh, so we can bundle these and you can certainly run this through an optimization algorithm where you set target values and then generate uh, material compositions, building compositions, etc. You can even link it to shapes. So like it's all the pieces are there, but that's another three years project. Let's be very <laughs> open about that because you need to uh, engineer the architecture of picking the pieces in a way to combine them in a meaningful way. But yeah, you have the toolbox is here. You can use it to build a slide if you want. So I have a final question. Sure. <laughs> yes, I have a question about the temporal dynamics. Yeah. So you are mentioning that you can look at different scenarios and so on. And I was wondering, um, for example, if we look at electricity mix, can you model, for example, year by year a change in mix? Or is it like more only a different a number of points that you can simulate? Or what is the granularity in terms of uh, dynamics? Yeah, sure. that you can so our time step is one year in the model. Everything is calculated on a yearly basis, heating degree hours, cooling degree hours. So we refresh these on an annual basis, prime energy coefficient, energy efficient. In terms of input, of course, you're not going to provide a vector of 100 values over 100 years and you spend your life doing so. Also, Gildas did provide a copy paste function from Excel and the drag and drop like in Excel in the interface, but that's for later. Uh, what you need to provide is interpolation points. So you tell us, I give you a very concrete example. So let's say you have an assessment that runs from the year one, so 1950 to 2050. You say, okay, at in the year 2000, the primary energy conversion factor for electricity in Belgium was 2.8 or 2.9. And I want it, I want to model it from that point onwards until 2050, I want to bring it down to 1.8 to year to present. So you tell us, okay, in 2000, it was 2.9. In 2010, it was 2.7, this I know for a fact. In 2023, it's 2.5. That's also something we know. And then you can add a few interpolation points. The code will interpolate between these points and generate annual, an annual vector year by year of all the values. And before 19, so from 1950 to two, so because we don't have data, we assume the last value and we keep it flat. So we do like this, and then we decrease until the end. If you want to stop before the end, you say, okay, we cannot improve it more than this. You put 20, 30, it will do like this, come down and then continue flat. But it's always year by year. And if you build a building after you start this, well, the building will inherit from of the values that corresponds to the year and then start its timeline on its own. So it's engineered in a way to handle, mm -hmm. it's not the matrix, but yeah, Neo is behind. Good. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I would like to thank you all for the interesting discussions also. I think uh, we have still a lot to discuss probably, but for us it's also time to move to the reception. I don't know if there are some practicalities that you would like to... Uh, yeah, I just think. also uh, wanted to thank also yeah. people online. So, just put that back. Voilà. So here it comes, that's the end. So for those who are still here, thanks a lot. I think there are still a few of, of you here. So if I go here, yeah, we still have 21 people in. So thanks for staying up and staying in. I see James, you're still here, warrior. So uh, yeah, thanks a lot for making it today. It's uh, really our, our great, great pleasure to be here. And I want to thank again all the people that made this possible. Huh? Their faces are up there and they all have made uh, very important contributions to the project. But most importantly, Katarina Gildas, without you, this is simply not possible. 
Roberto, without you, many of the things we saw today would not have been possible because we wouldn't have been able to reach that point. So thank you for making it possible. Really, I appreciate it. It's a lot of sleepless nights in the last months. In the words of Aristide, whom I touched base with, uh, he called it a sprintathon. And I thought it was a very good word to describe <laughs> what was happening. Uh, so, yeah, looking forward to working with um, most of you here. Thanks, Fabian, for the nice comment in the chat. And uh, yeah, uh, looking forward to taking this to the next level together, because in this team, at least we truly, truly believe that if you want to try and address these challenges, we need to team up. So the time of each one working in their corner for to get uh, an extra paper or citation, and that's not the point. We need to to work with the authorities, with the designers. Thanks, Just, and thanks for being here, Julia, as well, and representing this design side. No pressure. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good. This is how we, we make this happen together. So thanks a lot. Thanks for those joining from all over. And uh, yeah, let's see how we can take this to the next level. Cheers.